Hey, what's up guys? Back again with another video. This time I'm going to be showing you guys how to create an instant segmentation machine learning model for soccer matches using V7. Here's exactly what we will be creating. This is using a computer vision technique of machine learning called instant segmentation. It is simply a type of machine learning model that can identify and demarcate the different types of objects it is trained on. So I'll tell you more about that in a second. But as you can see here, each of the players on the field are outlined and identified. So you can see here that this person has been identified as a person. The pixels that make up that object are outlined using a polygon mask. And this percentage here essentially indicates how sure the model is of its prediction. Now I also mentioned that we're going to be using something called V7. And V7 is a great company that specializes in these types of tasks and gives you an entire platform for building a data set, uh, annotating that data set, and training models, and much more honestly. So I'll tell you more about that too in a second. But this is going to be a video that makes up a three-part video series where I show you the entire process from beginning to end uh, how to create this type of machine learning model. So each video will have timestamps so you can skip around if you want and you know go to the other videos in the series if you want to as well. I'll link those in the description below. And so stay tuned if you want to see how to create a machine learning model that can do this. Now what exactly is instant segmentation? So in computer vision, there are three somewhat similar types of tasks that you can do. Um, there's more than that, obviously, but these are three similar ones that um, are related to what we're working on. And so that is object detection, semantic segmentation, and then instant segmentation. Object detection is one of the easier ones. It involves identifying objects within an image and then giving them a bounding box so that they can be located. So as you can see here, each of the players on the field are surrounded with a box. That's a, called a bounding box and that sort of signifies where the model found that person or the object that it's trained to look for. And then over here you have semantic segmentation, which goes a step further by not only identifying the objects, but also assigning each pixel in the image to a particular object class. So the different colors here distinguish the different type of class that it's trying to assign it to. Instant segmentation takes it a yet another step further by not only identifying and classifying the objects, but also distinguishing between individual instances of each object. So what that means is that not only can it identify all of the objects of a particular type within an image, but it can also distinguish between all of the different ones. So that is why it is called instant segmentation because it can tell between the different instances of a particular object that the model is trained on. So here again, we can see that all of the players are identified on the field, but they are all given different colors. So behind the scenes, it is still able to locate all the different objects that are players, but more importantly, it's able to identify all the different instances of those players. So it can sort of count each different type of object of that type, not just sort of color all the different ones that look like that object, okay? And also another thing about instant segmentation is that it's more precise than object detection because it identifies objects using polygons that are accurate down to the pixel instead of a box. So now let's talk about why this is useful. Why would we want to do this? And the specific model that we're going to be training, what can it do for us? It's just so useful for a variety of things, but here are just a few examples relevant to what we're going to be working on. So one example is player tracking. So since we have a model that can identify every player on the field, we can also identify their location. And so that plays into also performance analysis. We can sort of keep track of individual player analysis, how they're moving, uh, how much time they have the ball and stuff like that, uh, where they are on the field. So formation analysis, performance analysis in general is very important. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not the biggest soccer fan, but I did watch the World Cup and I learned a little bit about it. But one thing that I learned is that being offside is kind of important because I think if you are offside and you make the goal, then it doesn't count or something like that. Um, so basically there's a set of rules that determine if the player is offside at that point in time and they're kind of tricky and so software can be helpful with that. So you can use that player tracking software to track where the player is and also determine if they're offside or not. That's just an example. And lastly, another good reason for building this type of machine learning model is just so you can learn computer vision and building machine learning models. It's a very good use case and it's pretty easy to do using V7 at least. So I think it's fun. Everyone loves soccer, right? Um, and then one more thing I want to tell you about is this thing on the right here. So this is, I thought it was a brain at first, but it's definitely not. This is a MRI or some other sort of medical scan that has a bunch of organs within it or different parts of the body of, um, a person. So you have the left kidney, the right kidney, the right, adrenal, the right adrenal gland, aorta, pancreas, stomach, portal vein, and splenic vein, liver. Um, you have all these different parts of a person's uh, body. And so someone has built an instant segmentation model here that is able to identify all those different types of objects. So here you can see that it's using a polygon mask to outline all of those different uh, organs. And yeah, so you can use this for 
you know, all types of medical applications. One big thing when it comes to machine learning within the medical field is actually detecting tumors. So uh, yeah, it's very useful everywhere, okay? So how are we gonna train this machine learning model? So the first thing that we need to do is build a data set, okay? So we need to find images on the internet and then upload them to our data set. And then we need to annotate them and label the objects within them. So in our example, we're gonna be using polygon masks. So you would use that to sort of outline each player on the field. So you're gonna identify every player on the field and outline them with a polygon mask, okay? And then once you build that data set, you're gonna use it to train a model. So you're gonna take all that data that you have annotated and feed that into a model. And the model is gonna use that to learn how to do it itself. So it's able to say sort of like, hey, okay, this is how the human being did it. Let me use that to teach myself and see if I can do it like they did it. And if you give it enough data and the data is good quality, then it should be able to learn pretty well. And you should be able to create a model that does what I showed you at the beginning of this video. But now let's talk about V7. Now, V7 is a company and they have a piece of software called Darwin. And it's a piece of software, it's more like a tool set or a platform though, because it's just got so many cool things that we can use to do all of this that we're gonna be doing. And it's gonna help us in the entire process from beginning to end. So it can help us build a data set, we can upload images to Darwin, we can then use Darwin to annotate those images. So it has a really good suite of tools for uh, image annotation, as you can see here. This is actually the auto annotate tool. So it's able to automatically put a polygon mask over something, which is very powerful. I'll be showing you that very soon. Um, but yeah, it's got that really cool auto annotate tool, which is actually gonna allow you to label 10 times faster than otherwise. Um, it's got a bunch of other labeling tools that are advanced and easy to use, and it gives you full control over the data set and workflow for you and your team. It's important to stress that though, it's important to stress that also this is a professional platform primarily for companies, and already there are over 100 companies from the Forbes 500 that use V7. So even though I'm personally am using V7 as a hobbyist more or less, V7 is built for and geared towards teams of people. And then with all of that, you can actually train the model within V7. This entire process, you never really have to leave V7 and uh, their Darwin software, which is really cool. So even if you're experienced or maybe you have no experience with computer vision or building these types of machine learning models, the V7 Darwin software is gonna allow you to do this very easily. Hopefully you're excited for that. Now I mentioned before that this is gonna be a three part video series. So in this video, we're gonna be creating a data set and then also building our workflow. I'm gonna show you how to create the data set, how to upload images to that data set, and then how to create a workflow and the different things that we can do to that workflow to uh, sort of change how we want things to work. How we want data to go from our data set through the annotation process, go to review and all those cool things. So the next thing that we're gonna be doing is annotating our data set. So that involves going into the images one by one and identifying all the players on the field and sort of outlining them with a polygon mask. And with that entire process, we're gonna be exploring all the tools in Darwin by V7 for annotating. So the auto annotate tool, um, the brush tool, all the tools that we're gonna be needing to build this machine learning model. And then in the last video, we're going to import some more data because we're gonna need a good amount of data to build a machine learning model. They recommend at least 100 instances of a specific class. Um, but what we're gonna be doing is importing a bunch of data using the Darwin CLI tool. But yeah, we're gonna be importing a bunch of images and their annotations. So I found a public data set that has a bunch of images and they're all pre-annotated and we're gonna be importing that into Darwin, okay? And then once we're done, we're good to go. We can start taking all that data within the data set and train a model. And we're gonna test it out by feeding it images that are not annotated and it should spit out annotated images. So, and that's it for the introduction. Now you should have a good idea of what we're gonna be doing in this mini series. But hopefully you're excited now. So let's jump into V7 and get started with a new data set and creating a workflow. All right, so let's go ahead and make a data set. The data set is where we're gonna have all of our files and all of the annotations for those files so that we can then train a model later on, okay? So on here, on Darwin by V7, just go to new data set, click that, and that's gonna walk you through the process of creating a new data set. So first we just need to give it a name. I'm just gonna call mine soccer, or you can call yours football, whatever you wanna call it. So soccer or something like soccer data, whatever you want, but I'll just call mine soccer. So continue. And now here you can actually drag and drop pretty much any file type that you would need. So it supports uh, just the generic ones like PNG, JPEG, JPG, even video files such as MP4s or MOVs. It also supports formats that you probably never have heard of. Maybe you have, maybe you have not, um, such as you know MRI scans. There's like a special format for that that medical professionals will use. So you can upload those as well because computer vision and all that is very important for that field as well. So you can drag and drop them into this little part here, like I said before. 
But if you have a large amount of files, like thousands of files and images and stuff like that, if you want to really you know, train a model that is built on a lot of data, then what you can do is upload the data using the Darwin CLI, the command line interface tool. So this is essentially a, a command that you can run on your computer's command line that will upload a bunch of images. And I'll show you how to do that later in the video because there's a lot of images that I wanna upload to this data set. But before we do that, I'm gonna show you the process of uploading images manually and then annotating them, okay? So what I've got here are two files of just basically camera footage from a soccer match. And then you got this one here. It's a WebP file, which is also supported by V7, which is very nice. But uh, it's basically an image that you can open within a browser, I guess. So it's very common nowadays when downloading images from the internet. So what I'm gonna do is take both of these files here and then simply drag and drop them into this thing here. It's gonna automatically upload them for me, as it says up here. Very easy process. But whatever you want to put into your data set, once it's uploaded here, just click continue. So now we're gonna do two things. First, we need to set up a data set instructions uh, page here. So this is where you can basically tell whoever's doing the annotation how you want the images to be annotated. So you can give instructions on the proper way to annotate images, what to look for, basically just a set of rules for how you want your data to be properly annotated uh, so that you can ensure that the process is going along in a good way. Now I'm just working by myself, so I'm not really gonna need a set of instructions for my data set. I already know exactly how I'm gonna be doing things. Uh, but you can define your own set of instructions if you want to for yourself or for a team of people. Um, of course, it really doesn't make sense for me to put, you know, write all that down for myself. But V7 is made for teams of people who are working on annotating uh, data sets and coming up with models. And it's a, it's a whole part of a whole workflow that uh, you want to set up, which we're going to be doing in a second. Actually, we're going to see how to set up a workflow. But usually you're going to have a group of annotators who are annotating images in your data set and you want to give them an instruction set of how to properly do all the annotating and all that stuff, okay? So this is where you can set that, and of course it can be changed later on in the process if you want to. The next part of this component is actually much more important, it's the data set classes. These are what you're going to be using to actually annotate the images or videos or whatever you're going to be annotating. So let's go ahead and check that out. So we're going to create a new class, and you have a bunch of options here. You have polygon, bounding box, tag, skeleton, line, key point, ellipse, and cuboid. A bounding box is pretty much the most simple way of identifying something within an image. Uh, it's simply putting a box around so an object. And so this is specifically useful for object detection, which I talked about earlier. So basically taking individual objects within an image and identifying them, giving them labels. So this is what that would be used for. So if for some reason I want to identify all the players in my soccer images, with a bounding box, I could go in to each of my images in my data set, put a box around each player, throw that into a model, and then the model would spit out bounding boxes for whatever new images you put into it if it's trained correctly. But the cool thing about this is that if you hover over the eye icon here, it actually gives you a summary of what the annotation type is, the pros and cons of it, and what it's used for. So in this case, like I said before, it's used for object detection which you can see at the bottom. You can see it's good for uniformly shaped objects, objects that don't overlap in low compute projects. And it's also bad for elongated objects, textures and large background objects, something that's not, you know, not well defined, of course, and then composite objects. And like I said, these are very common, but another common type that you have are polygons, which is a more precise way of annotating stuff within an image. So instead of drawing a box around the object that you're trying to annotate, you're gonna actually basically outline all of the pixels of the object that you're trying to annotate. So it's much more precise, okay? So this is called a polygon mask. It's used to train object detection, semantic segmentation, and instant segmentation, which we're gonna be working on. So just in general, this is good for instant segmentation, but also it's good for when you want a really precise segmentation of a image. So instead of just a general box over something, you have a really precise polygon that sort of highlights a border around the entire a pixelated object, which I'll be showing you more in detail in a second. It'll make much more sense when I show you, but uh, if you recall back to early in the presentation, I showed you exactly what that would look like. So the other type that we have here is a tag. This is another common one uh, used for image classification, which is a different machine learning model type other than object detection and instant segmentation. Now this is basically when you take an image, input it into a model, and then it tells you what the image represents. So like a cat, a dog, whatever you're trying to classify, okay? And then you have more, so you have like a skeleton for representing the pose of an object. You have key points, lines, you have ellipses, cuboids. And along with each of these annotation types, you also have subtypes. 
So you can actually add more metadata onto those annotations that you're creating onto an image. So just as an example, if I have a polygon and let's say that I want to, you know, sort of select any cat within an image, I would use a polygon to do that, right? To segment out all the cats in the image, but I can also have attributes for each of those instances or each of those cats that describe the color of the cat and other sort of metadata that you want to include with that. Um, whatever you want, the species of a cat, whatever you want, okay? But one that's especially relevant to polygon and instance segmentation at least is an instance ID. This allows you to identify different objects across different images or across frames of a video. We can keep track of a specific player, a specific object across different images within our data set, which is really cool, taking that to the next level. So that's especially useful if you're doing video as well because you can uh, keep track of the player as they're moving across the screen, even though they're in a different position. And speaking of player movement, you also have a directional vector subtype, so you can sort of indicate what direction the player is moving. So I'm not going to specifically show this one in this video, but that's something that I'm going to definitely explore in the future. If you're curious about that, let me know. But anyway, now that we have a overview of the different annotation types within V7, I kind of rambled a little bit, but I want it to be very detailed so you know exactly what the correct annotation type you want to go for is. Now that we know all that, I want to show you how to actually create the classes that we're going to be using within our data set, okay? So in this case, like I told you before, since we're doing instance segmentation, the best type of annotation that we're going to be using is a polygon. So we're going to select polygon, and then we're going to give it a name. So this is just going to be player, because we're going to be uh, segmenting out all the players within an image, okay? And then we can also choose a color if we want to. So we can choose each player to be pink or red whatever color you want. And we're not gonna choose any of the subtypes, we're just gonna keep it pretty simple today. I just wanna show you how to train a basic instance segmentation model. So we're gonna click add class, and there we go. So now we have a data set class for players. So whenever we take images in our data set and start annotating them, we can select all of the players within the image and train the model based on that, okay? So once you're done with that, click save and continue. And now we can set up the workflow. This is another very important part of this process, especially if you're working with a team, or if you just want a really well-defined way to work with your data set. And V7 makes it really easy. You can choose a basic workflow template. So I'm gonna select that, it's already selected, and then click pick template. And here we go. We are now inside of our new data set that we just created. We can see that we have a data tab, a workflow tab, a classes tab, a quality tab, and a settings tab. Down here, we can see all of the images that make up our data set or video files or whatever type of file that you uploaded before. Over here on the right, we can see that we have different ways to filter the data set because of course, potentially in your data set, you may have thousands of different types of files. So it's very helpful to categorize them in different ways and filter down to uh, get to what you're trying to get to, okay? So in this case, we only have the new category filled up with two files, that's why it says two there. So if you were to click, for example, being annotated, nothing would show up because we have nothing in that category at the moment. And these different categories here are also dependent on our workflow what stage the the file is within the workflow, which we're gonna check out now. So go ahead and go to workflow, and this will pull up the graph here for our workflow for our projects. So this is pretty cool if you ask me. This is where you can essentially define how you want the data set to go in terms of how you want the annotation process to happen. So let's just take a look at what we got so far. This is the basic template that they gave us. So we have the data set. This is just where all the files sit whenever you first add a file. And then when you send a file to the next stage, that will go to the annotation stage. So this is simply where a worker, or in this case, anyone, as it says here, will annotate an image and then send it to the review stage. And then in the review stage, it's either accepted or rejected. If it is accepted, you can see that there's this little line that goes to the complete stage, and this will make it so that it's done and ready to be trained into a model. Or if it's rejected, you can see that the line goes all the way back to the annotate stage. So the image will actually go back to the annotated stage, okay? So pretty self-explanatory just by looking at it, right? These lines sort of dictate the direction that files will go in terms of the stage that they're in, okay? And this is a pretty good setup for anyone who's just trying to get, you know, get started here and, you know, get stuff done. But you can actually play around with this and change it if you want to to make it custom. So for example, if I wanna do something like add um, another review stage, I can do that. So I can um, hold and drag a new review stage onto this um, graph here. And then I can move this along and just put this right in the middle. So for example, if I have a team of people who are working for me, you know, like workers, you know, people who are annotating um, different sort of admins within my project and my data set, 
Um, let's say that I want it to be very thorough though, and I want a double review process, okay? So what I can do is have the data go from the data set to the annotation stage. So a worker is gonna annotate that, and it's gonna go to the review stage, number one. And then after that, if it's accepted, it's gonna go to review, review stage number two. So just by clicking this, I can sort of reset that. I can drag and drop that onto this new uh, node point here. Let me fix this one too, so if it's rejected, I can go back to here. So again, that will send any rejected files back to the annotate stage. And then in the second review stage, so review and then one, you can actually change the name if you want to. We'll say review number two. Um, if that's accepted, then it goes on to the complete stage. If it's rejected, it'll go back to, we can actually make a choice. We can either send it back to the annotate stage or back to review number one. I'm just gonna go ahead and send it back to the annotate stage. So you can see that the lines clearly define uh, where things are going. Um, you can see that it's sort of like a little visual glitch here, but it is working. Just have to, you have to move that and it'll readjust it right there. Now it's lined up perfectly. But also after you're done making changes, make sure you click save and apply and that will save everything and apply it, <laughs> obviously. Um, but let's see what else we can do. So for example, if you wanna edit a specific stage like the annotate stage, you can do that by clicking it. And then we can actually define who we want to be able to annotate images within our data set, or not images rather, I should say files within our data set. Even though probably most of the time you're gonna be working with images anyway. Um, but yeah, we can change the name. We can search for specific users that we want to be able to annotate. Right now we can see that selected on anyone. So I'm gonna select uh, me, Cody Simpson, and then someone else on my team, Kalen. And those two people would be the ones that are gonna be annotating the files that come into our data set, okay? So once they are done annotating, it's gonna be sent to the review stage, and then it's gonna be accepted or rejected. And that process is pretty self-explanatory, but we can also choose who we want to be reviewers in our project. So let's say that um, Kaylin's a worker, right? And I am an admin, and I wanna be the person that's reviewing all of the work that she does. So what I can do is click my first review stage and then set myself as the reviewer. Now I'm the only one who can review her work because you know I've assigned myself to that. And then we have review number two, and of course you're gonna have more people on your team most likely, so you can set whoever you would want to be in that stage if you want to, okay? And yeah, so you have pretty granular control over the process of your workflow, which is very nice within V7. And another stage that's really interesting is the model stage, which I will actually be showing you later in the video once we get a model trained. But basically you can take files from your data set, send them into the model stage to go into your model that you've trained, and then have it automatically annotate the image, or try to at least, and then you can review that, complete it if it's great, and you can set up a whole workflow based on that as well, alongside the actual people who are annotating images manually. But that's pretty much it for that for now. Um, what I wanna do is go ahead and reset this though to how it was before. So I'm gonna just take this and do it like that. So files go from my data set to the annotator stage, to the review stage, and then to the complete stage. Looks good to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and do save and apply. All right, so that's pretty much it for this episode. We accomplished everything that we wanted to accomplish. So we created a new data set. We defined a player class using a polygon mask. And then we created a new workflow. I showed you how a workflow works and the different ways that you can configure it to define how you want uh, the data within your data set to move across the different stages. And in the next episode, I'll be showing you guys how to annotate the images within your data set, how to annotate specific players and label them as players, and how to use the really cool tools that come along with Darwin so that you can do it very easily. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully you're excited. Hopefully you learned a lot in this episode and hopefully you enjoyed it. I want to take a second to also thank all the members on my channel. If you see yourself on the screen right now, I really appreciate you for watching my videos and becoming a member. I really, really appreciate your support. If you want to become a member yourself though, you can join for at least 99 cents a month and you get some cool perks like a cool rank on my Discord server. You get yourself on the screen like you see right now and you also get early access to new videos. So if that sounds good to you, feel free to join. If not, it's okay. I really do appreciate you watching my videos anyway. And that's all I got. So if you like this video, leave a like. If you need to see more, subscribe and peace.